Welcome back to the Rhinestone Podcast. My name is Banner Driscoll, and we are happy to have you join us yet again for another episode. I want to start off by telling you guys a story. Um, Like most people my age, I had a classic rock dad. And what I mean by that is my dad just inundated me with classic rock radio growing up. Um, It was KZOK in the Seattle area. And we would just listen to these records. And at the time, KZOK had this really diverse group of bands they would play. They'd play weird stuff from the 60s, from the 70s, from the 80s. And they also were really good at playing a lot of deep cuts. And I was always, my dad just always had this station on in the car, always had KZOK on in the car. And one day we were driving home from somewhere and uh, a song came on the radio. And the song was Lay It On The Line by a rock band named Triumph. And, you know, my dad, like, you know, he liked Led Zeppelin. He liked, you know, all sorts of things. But I remember my dad lit up when this song came on because it was a deep cut that not a lot of people were playing on the radio at this point. And, you know, the song came on and the vocals were just like out of this world amazing. And the song was really good. My dad was just singing along. And my dad just turns to me and he goes, Triumph is the most underrated rock band of all time. They are so good. That is one of the best bands. One of the best shows I ever saw was Triumph. You know, there's a lot of fakes and posers out there. Triumph was the real thing. And Rick Emmett is the man. And I just, that moment, I was like, oh man, like, this is serious for my dad. And he's like, the best thing Canadian, Canada, or the best thing Canada has ever produced besides Rush is Triumph. You got to go check out Triumph. And, you know, I didn't really pay much attention to it at the time, but as I got older, I started digging through records a lot deeper than I did when I was that age. Um, I found um, Triumph and just really fell in love with the sound. And I really fell in love with Rick Emmett's guitar playing and singing and the drums and the bass and the production and what the lyrics were about. The lyrics had this very uplifting, like, we can make it vibe, you know. It was about deeper things than just, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And, you know, it's it, Triumph was just one of those things that, like, they were always cool in my head, you know. Like, I, especially as a musician, you find these things, you just know it. And, you know, I've, I've gone all sorts of places, you know. I've been into jazz and indie rock and... Um, hip hop and all these things, but Triumph's one of those bands I just always come back to and am like completely blown away with. Which is why it's unbelievable that we have Triumph guitarist and Triumph lead singer Rick Emmett on our podcast today. I mean, y'all, what? What? For real. This is unbelievable. Um, as soon as I got this interview confirmation, I called my dad and told him, and he was just like, whoa, you know. Anytime you can impress your dad, you know, it's like, you, you milk that for all it's worth, right? Because dads are so hard to impress. And my dad was like, wow, good job, you know, and that meant everything. But Rick is just, is this just amazing musician. And I, I'm so happy we got a chance to talk to him because Rick has honestly taken a, the, the, past, the path left traveled in the music industry. Um, you know, I mean, he was at the height of his fame with Triumph and he left the band in 1988. And um, rather than just go and like make a solo career he began doing all sorts of other things he went completely independent very few label interactions everything was smaller label no big production type stuff um i mean he's gone in so many different directions musically from uh, instrumental jazz to solo guitar pieces to singer songwriter stuff to rock stuff with his res 9 project he's collaborated with all sorts of musicians and it's just it's phenomenal and he's done this while also teaching as a professor um, who taught the music industry and songwriting. He works in all sorts of songwriting workshops. And, you know, from you can tell from this interview is that Rick just genuinely loves music. And that's just what's so amazing to me. So before we get in, I wanted to highlight one thing, which is uh, the, I think, the greatest rock and roll performance of all time, all time, is Triumph at the 1983 US Festival in California. I want you guys to get a sense of how good of a vocalist he was because, I mean, there's so many great vocalists from the 80s. I think Rick Emmett might be the greatest of all time. So, And, y'all, I mean, Rick has still got it. Even in he's pushing, he just turned 70, and he still sounds unbelievable. He still sounds so good, and he still has a good bit of his range, too. Obviously, he's not hitting those high Fs and F sharp, but Rick is the man, and I'm so happy that we got a chance to interview him. So without further ado, here's our interview with Rick Emmett of Triumph and of his solo career and everything else he's done. You guys are gonna love it. Oh, and one last thing I forgot to mention, Rick just released a memoir called Lay It On The Line. It is fantastic, I got to to read a press copy of it. Um, You guys should also check that out, it's fantastic. You guys are gonna love it if you guys wanna deep dive onto Rick. Um, But 
check out Rick Emmett. Love this interview. I'm so happy, you guys. I can't even like hide it. Like this was just unbelievable that we got to interview a rock icon. Welcome back to the Rhinestone Podcast, your guide through the twists and turns of the music industry. I'm your host, Banner Driscoll, and today we're turning the spotlight on a true rock icon, Rick Emmett. Rick's musical journey is as legendary as his guitar solos. As one of the driving forces behind Triumph from 1975 to 1988, Rick is a rock legend with a career spanning five dazzling decades. He's not only a guitar virtuoso, but also an acclaimed singer and songwriter. Rick's musical path has been paved with gold and platinum records, earning him a spot in the Canadian Rock Hall of Fame, the Music Industry Hall of Fame, and many more. In addition to his rock legacy, Rick's musical exploration knows no bounds. He has released 19 studio albums under his own name and has ventured into diverse genres from prog rock to Latin guitar to singer-songwriter. Beyond the stage, Rick Emmett was a respected columnist for Guitar Player Magazine, sharing his wisdom through his Back to Basics series, and he was an influential music educator at Humber College in Toronto for decades. He's also the Artistic Director Emeritus of the annual Song Studio Songwriting Workshop, nurturing the next generation of musical talent. Rick Emmett's creative genius also extends to his writing with the published po- or published poetry collection titled Reinvention and his new memoir, Lay It on the Line, a backstage pass to rock star adventure, conflict and triumph, which comes out today, the day of this recording, October 10th, 2023. Rick Emmett, welcome to the Rhinestone Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great, Banner. Thank you. Awesome, man. How has the uh, reception been so far to your new memoir? Uh, it's been very gratifying, humbling. Um, I, I, uh, it, it, there's something surreal about having a memoir come out because, I mean, there's a part of you when you're deciding you're going to do it that goes, eh, do I really want to do this? Like, you know, how much of my past do I want to be dragging up and going over? And I mean, I, uh, Rolling Stones have just got a, a new album out and they're doing the rounds and Mick Jagger said, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to ever write a memoir. I'm just not. And I, and I relate to that. And I think every uh, artist should probably have a big chunk of themselves where they're concerned about the future. Like the, the, you live in the present, but as an artist, you're just kind of looking at the horizon and going, hey, I wonder what's up over there, you know? It, looking backwards is kind of weird and surreal. Plus, you start doing the rounds and, you know, doing interviews and stuff, and there's the whole thing of... Uh, Folks, you know, they're kind of congratulating you on your life and telling you all these, you know, that's been a lovely thing. But it's also like, it's almost like you're a ghost attending your own wake. And, you know, people are celebrating your life and you go, well, yeah, hang on for a sec. My life isn't over yet. You know, like, yes, I wrote about that stuff. And yes, it's the past. But, you know, I have ongoing, I'm a creative guy. I still got things that I'm doing, you know, um, I, 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 I'm not used to living in this place where we're talking about me and all of the things that I did, you know, all of these many years ago. And you kind of go, oh, that's kind of boring, isn't it? Let's, let's move on to something else. So there's a, there's a surreal kind of quality to it. Well, you know, that's fascinating because one of the questions I have for you is in your memoir, one of the first lines is you mentioned that what you lay on the line is your creativity. How has that manifested in your life choices, both creatively and personally? Um, well, uh, you know, uh, one of the lines in that song, laying on the line, is, you know, uh, I don't ask for much. The truth will do just fine, you know. Um, so, you know, dealing with the truth, the truth is often a double-edged sword, you know. Uh, you can use it to cut through some stuff, but... You could also cut yourself. You could also maybe harm people that, you know, you're swinging this thing around and you might harm somebody that you didn't really intend. You know, the truth might be a little too brutal for for some folks and they don't deserve that, you know. Um, so, you know, um, there does always have to be a kind of a, 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 an imposition of, of common sense and of uh, rationale. I think what what it led me towards was the idea of uh, trying to be virtuous as opposed to, you know, leading towards my vice and my greed and my ego and, you know, all of these other things that kind of get in the way of trying to do something good, something productive for others, which, you know, uh, in the end, 
uh, especially for you know someone like you and this site and the things that you're involved in, like the idea of music is that it, it needs to find its way to an audience, it, 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 and it it's not really fulfilled until it's been shared in that regard that it's been floating in the air and somebody's heard it. You know uh, that becomes an important thing. So even if you know you're the kind of artist, the kind of musician that sort of sits around thinking. Why don't I just do this for me? I this is all about me and my own self gratification and my own self exploration and well, that's all well and good, but there does have to be a balance to that with whoever's going to hear it, whoever's going to consume it, you know, whoever's going to be at the other end of the bargain here. Um, which is one of the beautiful things about music is that it is a, it's a shared kind of uh, experience and and. Uh, yeah, it floats in the air with the greatest of ease. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, you know, I've, I've learned that lesson many times over that the audience is just as important as it's the creator or the performer. You know, if you if their interpretation can hold just as much weight as 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 the creator's person. I mean, there's so many examples of that in all sorts of. Uh, you know, from film and music and books and literature, like the 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 meaning of stuff can sh of art can change very quickly. You know can and i used to tell students all the time look don't uh don't work down to your audience and don't work up to your audience your audience is is not more important than you and i think some people get in show business and they start to make sort of compromises because they're oh they want to sell more they want to you know they want a bigger audience they they and then maybe that starts to color their work in a way that's not good and also if you're working down that you know that that is it's not necessarily good either because you know now you're starting to think you're maybe something you're not you're you're taking on airs and and you know blowing yourself out of proportion so that idea of honesty that idea of a straight line that goes right from you to to an audience what you're really hoping to generate from that straight line is this thing that kind of circles through the air where there's a an exchange of energy. There's a power, you know, cycle that starts to occur, which is like the hydrologic cycle of water. You know, you've got your uh, uh, precipitation, condensation, evaporation. You know, all these things that it, the cycle goes, and the energy of music is very much that. And I think you can't get too full of yourself. That gets in the way. So now you talked about going not looking above your audience and looking below your audience. Have you ever caught yourself doing that as oh, yeah. a, in your creative career? And and how have you, if you have caught that, how have you course corrected so that you can get back to looking at your audience in, right in the eye? Yeah, I mean, I for me, the, I think the, the, the final solution, I mean, obviously you can look in the mirror and, you know, try to be pretty honest and say, who are you and what are you doing? What's, what's going on here? But I, I, for me, the answer was always, just let the music lead you. Let the music be the thing that's out in front of you and let it tell you. Like I, in songwriting classes, I used to tell students all the time, once you get this to a certain point, once you've had a lot of experience, really what you want to kind of be is like a song whisperer. You kind of want to, what is the song telling you it wants to become? And it's, it's a subtle thing, but it's a real thing. And... You know, uh, most of the great songwriters of the history of songwriting will say, yeah, it's a mystery. I don't know. <laughs> this creative thing. I don't know where the really good stuff comes from, but when it comes, I'm really glad that it did, you know. And if I knew more, I would go there more often. If, if I knew where that was, I would visit that place and I would get that stuff more often. But I work so that I can, you know, have those moments where Oh, it came to me. Oh, it revealed itself to me. Oh, the layers of the onion peeled away, and you know, I cried and I cried. <laughs> no, I, but I, I think that that's that process is that's the critical thing. That you have to sort of love the process, and you have to hope that the work you're going to develop an, an ability, an instinct for hearing what the work is trying. And I think that keeps you humble. That makes it so that you're not working up, you're not working down. You know. Mm -hmm. What does your songwriting process look like right now? Are you are you the kind of guy who just collects ideas on your iPhone? Are you making demos in Pro Tools? Are you pen to paper? 
how are you how is your songwriting process on a mechanical level right now all of those things uh, uh you know <laughs> and uh i do i do tend to be old school so for me uh i like i do collect ideas on my voice memos on my iphone and those are i th- i sort of think of that as kind of acorn hunting you know like uh there, there's ones where I'll go, ooh, there's an oak tree in that one for sure. You know, I just got to give that the right amount of water and sunlight and and plant it in some decent soil, and that that's going to become a good idea. Uh, but that's that's just a, like I said, seed hunting. It's it's not big. Then I go to the notebooks and spiral notebooks, three ring uh, paper in three ring binders. Uh, that way I can move them around and they open up and they can sit on a music stand. And, and I do a lot of my work old school just like that. That's not to say that I don't have uh, Pro Tools and an iMac and, you know, that. Uh, then there's a process where you start recording ideas. And yes, we live in the digital universe now. And those ideas, like sometimes you might get a little idea that is on your phone and it may not get any better than that, that you could literally fly it on over and start to build something, you know, using that idea. But I'm not really, I'm more old school than that. You know, I mean, I was around, well, the Triumph, literally, we bought studio, we had, you know, 24 track MCI machines, and then we got studios, and then we could lock two 24 studios together. And the idea of you, you rehearsed and did pre production until you got to the point where you could go into the studio and lay down beds and then start doing overdubs. And that was old school and I liked it. It was the way I learned how to do it. So even now, digitally, I don't, I'm not creative using recordings as the way that I create music, but I know that you can. And I know that the whole world of hip hop wouldn't exist. Rapid hip hop is all about you create in the box, you know, and you get your ideas and then you top line them, et cetera, et cetera. I understand that all that works. And it's just, I'm not that kind of guy. And you're asking me about me now and my process now. I am the kind of guy now where, as you can see from, you know, all the guitars in the background, I kind of get lost. You know, I don't go on the road and play anymore, but when I'm writing, I'm thinking uh, about guitar pieces jazz guitar pieces in particular, finger style kinds of things. And then I go, okay, I'm going to learn how to play these things. And then I'm going to call up an engineer so that I don't have to sit there clicking buttons and, you know, dragging mice around. And I'm going to just perform when the red light goes on. And I'm going to try not to have to do too many edits. (laughs) And I'm going to try not to have, like, I'd love to be able to get from A to Z of the piece and, and have it all be of one thing just like the old school guys had to do um but you know uh, chances are in a digital universe i will do a few a few edits and you know i'm gonna have the a section from tape 43 i'm gonna have the b section for you know whatever like that's how it works it is it definitely is so how so obviously one of the things i do love about you is is you're not outside of triumph you've released 19 albums um, that I counted and you they go all over the place right they go I mean you've got stuff in jazz you've got stuff in in Latin music you've got stuff in prog rock you've got your res 9 project so when you are making these acorns as you say on your iPhone or you know on your pencil and paper and all that type of stuff how are you picking your musical projects like how does the the process go from the acorns to like all right we have enough material to make a solid album out of this style what is the process like for picking musical projects? Um, well, I, I never stop writing. Writing is something that I do on a daily basis as a kind of a ritual, but also a discipline. And um, so sometimes ideas are, I, I don't get stylistically into them. I just get them and go, I'm not going to think about that yet. Just know that uh, that's an idea that I like and store it away for later. Squirrel, squirrel it away. Um, some things, they're more like they just bite you right in your rear end and they won't let go. And then it's like, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to start working this up a little bit. Or 
as I said earlier, the whole idea of song whispering, the song is saying, you know, yes, this is a musical idea. This is a chord change that you've got a melody over top of, but this really is going to be a, a song that you're going to need lyrics for. So what is the chord change in that melody suggesting to you in terms of an emotional mood or, you know, um, the color of it, like the feeling of it? Emotion is a big, big thing. So I always, and I would tell songwriting students this all the time, once an idea is starting to germinate and you're, you know, it's developing, uh, if you've got an emotional heart for that thing, you know, that you're talking about the loneliness you felt when you were 15 years old and your first girlfriend dropped you, you know, then write that at the top of the page and underline it because everything emotionally that happens in that song is coming up to relate back to that. Whether the song ends up being about that or not, it might not. The story might go in another direction then the song might lead you somewhere else. But emotionally, you want the song to have a heart, you know, so that's a big thing in the development of it. And uh, now that I've been yakking for the last couple of minutes, I've lost, lost my thread. <laughs> I hope oh. I answered the question. Um, I, think, I think you gave some great stuff, but basically what we were asking was like, how do you pick your, how does the go from the acorn to like the big musical projects and the stylized kind of albums that you've kind of made? Yeah, okay, so, so as these things, you know, developing ideas happen, of course, also in my life, there, uh, there's also a career. And in that career, there'll be things where I get a phone call and somebody says, hey, Rick, you know, I had one, for example, you know, back in the summer where somebody said, hey, uh, we need a Blu-ray for a film score. Have you got anything? And I went, no, but, uh, you know, let me check my acorns and, you know, let me think about some stuff and, and it won't take me long. G give me a week. And, and I'll get in the studio, and I can I can deliver that. So um, if, uh, if you mentioned my uh, album that I did for uh, Mascot Provoke, mm -hmm. where the Res Nine album, which was a kind of a R and B rock thing, and the older I get, the more I keep kind of rolling back to my roots, which were sort of blues and R and B. And so when Res Nine said, "Hey, we'll give you enough money that you can make a rock record." And I said, what kind of a record do you want? And they said, whatever kind of record you want to give us. And I went, okay, well, I think what I'm going to do is take some of these folk songs that I've written, some of these bluesy ideas that I've got up and running, and I'm going to start thinking about them now as if they're going to turn into stylized, kind of hard rock, classic rock, R&B rock kind of stuff. And I'm going to take a band into the studio, I'm going to rehearse it for a week, and then I'm going to cut beds. And I'm going to try and finish this album in a month. So these are all kind of career business kinds of decisions and choices that I'm making based on, well, how big of a budget did they give me? When are they expecting delivery, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Um, but do those things drive me as much as they did, you know, when I had a record contract with a major label and I was trying to get on the radio? No, you know, but I understand that way of thinking in that world you know so uh, i can operate there um but you know i've i've sort of got the luxury now of being semi-retired <laughs> you know no. but i i haven't retired from being creative but i've retired from the industry and, and what it you know might impose upon me in terms of uh, uh, a template of of what it is that i'm supposed to be delivering you know and i can indulge myself and go I think I feel like uh, working on my classical guitar nylon string chops for a long time, and let's see what happens there, you know? Mm -hmm. So, as you pointed out, in my career, in my life, I would do that. I would kind of move from, you know, one area of the ballpark over to another. I go, oh, I think I want to see what it's like to play third base. Oh, I think I want to remember what it was like to play center field when I, when I could run really fast, you know? Um, so, the that's part of it. Um, another part of it is is uh, just my own physical, mental state that I'll go, today I'm feeling uh, sad and I've got a little bit of arthritis going, so I better not push myself too hard. But on another day, I might be going, man, I feel like kicking some butt, you know, and, and then I'll be 
maybe much more aggressive in the way that I approach things. See, part of this too is, you know, I'm sorry to keep jumping around on you, Banner, but, but part of the thing is that I had a, I, I, I don't want to self-aggrandize or make myself, you know, seem too big, but I had a kind of a virtuoso level that I could bring to some of the things that I would attempt. So um, sometimes a song, it's not going to be about that at all. It becomes about, like when I did the poetry book, I wrote a couple of poems and they were just screaming at me, this is not a poem, this is really a lyric. You really should write a song. And then it was telling me, and don't get on your high horse here, buddy. Don't get Mr. Fancy Pants going. Make this be as simple as the way Hank Williams might approach a song or or Leonard Cohen, who really only uses a few cowboy chords to get where he wants to go. And you go, right, right, okay. And again, that's the song talking to me. That's the creative thing talking to me. Uh, but I, you know, uh, uh, not to make myself seem too... Uh, grandiose but i can't i have a range of things that I, I you know sometimes i could decide no 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 i'm writing a jazz piece and, uh, and it's going to be it's going to kick my own ass so that when people hear it they go holy my god you can play guitar so great you know and i go yeah thanks because that's what i was going for you know which is an ego thing i readily admit but nevertheless a new year is coming up and what does that mean? It is a new chance for you to rebirth your music career. And if there's one thing I really think is important to do is to get a good head or get your head straight on your mindset and on your path and your direction for your new year. One of the biggest problems I see with so many independent musicians that I talk to is there's just no direction. They're trying to do everything. They're trying to get into sync licensing. They're trying to get onto major festivals. They're putting a band together, a solo project, this, that, and the other. And there's just no real straight cohesive direction and what happens is, is when you try to go for everything you get nothing and this is just true over and over again anybody who's lived life for long enough knows this and the sad thing is I see so many artists with no direction they don't know they don't know like okay this is one two three four five of how I get to my next level or at least put me in a position where I can have the chance to go to that next level and I just know how hard it is because I struggled with this for a long time. Heck, even with Rhinestone for the first couple of years, I struggled with it. And now that I've found my direction, I've found my, my North Star and what I want to do, the options just clear up. And what happens is you end up saying yes to the things that actually matter to you and you say no to everything else. And you become niche down, you become a better product, you make more money and you help more people and you gain a better audience even a bigger audience a lot of times because you've become known as the guy who does this. So I want to help you find your direction. And that's what I really want to do. Now, what I do a lot of times, I do a one hour consulting session with artists and we go through everything. We go through your streaming numbers. We go through your YouTube. We go through your links. We go through your profile. We go through your branding. And in an hour, I guarantee you, I can find you a five point method to get you exactly where you want to go in the next six to 12 months. Now, normally these meetings cost $150 for an hour. I tell you what, I'm gonna make that half off. It is $75 an hour if you work with me today. Uh, so what you wanna do is you're gonna email me the word consulting at rhinestonemusic at gmail.com. That's consulting at rhinestonemusic, R-H-Y-N-E-S-T-O-N-E at gmail dot, or S-T-O-N-E music at gmail.com. And uh, let's get going. I want to give you a direction for your music because if you have no direction, you're not going to get anywhere, right? It's like trying to travel across the world and you don't have a Google Maps on you. So now don't be like that. Let's find a direction. Consulting, rhinestonemusic at gmail.com. You know, that leads perfectly into my next question, which is I saw a video of you recently performing at, I believe it was some songwriter convention. It might have been the Song Studio songwriting uh, uh, workshop. But you played um, Magic Power from Triumph. And one of the things that blows my mind was, you know, you're, you're pushing north of 60. We'll put it, leave it there. And your vocals and your guitar playing still sound incredible. And especially in a generation um, from the 80s who were known for pushing the upper limits of their vocals, for pushing the upper limits of their guitar playing. And a lot of those guys who are now in their upper 60s, they have lost a lot of that range. And my question to you is someone, I just turned 31 
And I'm at the point now in my life where I'm realizing my mortality a little bit. Not that I'm like aging too much, but you know, I'm realizing like I'm not 22 anymore. How have, do you have any advice to younger musicians for maintaining their playing abilities and their singing abilities as you have? Yeah. But before I go there, you know, what you just said reminded me, there's a John Mayer song. I think it's called, uh, stop this train. Yes. And he's, and he's, he's using the voice of his father and his father says something like, yeah, turn it's either 58 or 68. It's, I can't remember the number. But the the rhyme is re- renegotiate. Like, yeah, turn sixty eight, you'll renegotiate. And so, you know, I, when you were saying, "Oh, I'm thirty one," I go, "Huh?" Like, I, I'm not. <laughs> and, like, it doesn't bother me to talk about my age. I, you know, I I turned seventy this summer. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so I'm north of seventy now. Never mind at sixty. <laughs> I was um, trying to be nice. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Um, but. Um, when I was a young man, and I, as Billy Joel would say, when I wore a younger man's clothes, I um, I realized that I didn't want to be burning my candle at both ends, and that what I did in terms of singing and play was a kind of a great privilege that I kind of I I think of it as you know I have these gifts they were given to me. I, it's not like I you know I'm gifted. I, you know, I'm trying to make myself seem you know, uh, like uh, egotistical about this. I, I'm not. I'm humbled about this. That I, I have this. I had this thing that I could do. I could sing really high. I could sing higher than most folks. I could play guitar better than most people. And in my uh, memoir, I talk about the fact that, you know, I have this thing where I'm dextrosinistral, which is I do, you know, gross motor control with my left hand, uh, but I do fine motor control with my right. So uh, when I was first playing guitar I wanted to be like Paul McCartney and I had a guitar teacher he was left handed he said no no you're going to learn this way and I went this way no this is this feels weird he goes trust me give me a month your your strong hand's going to be on the fretboard you're going to have a huge advantage over all the rest of these right handed people in the world and if you think about numbers you know 10 people out of 100 are left handed one person out of 100 is dextrosinistral so I had this kind of gift as soon as I discovered a guitar this way, it was like, well, I'm off to the races here, you know? So if you're off to the races with gifts, how should you behave? Should I be staying up all night doing lines of coke and, and drinking in order to b- bring the coke back down? And, you know, uh, I, I could see that around me. And I went, nah, not the way, not, not the cloth I'm cut from. It doesn't make sense to me, you know. What I really want to do is be able to get up on stage tomorrow night in, you know, wherever we're going to be, you know, Des Moines, Tulsa, Norman, you know, somewhere in the Midwest, and I want to be able to bring it. I really want to be able to do it, you know. So there was a physical thing at the heart of all of this that I wanted to protect, nurture, because it was part of the gifts thing, you know. And if... The best thing about a gift is that it keeps on giving or, you know, it's better to give than it is to receive. Like, that was how I felt. I I really felt like I want to pass this along. I really want to, you know, have this be for the benefit of others, not just me. You know, although I'm in the middle of this, so I'm benefiting, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm digging the benefit of all of this um, and I'm enjoying it. I didn't want to do it and screw it up, you know, so. Were there That's any- my only spare bear, you know. <laughs> don't stay up drinking too late, you know. Get yourself a good night's sleep and make sure you hydrate. Are there any other technical things you were doing to maintain your voice? Because, I mean, I even saw clips from you from five years ago singing uh, Magic Power. And, I mean, you're still hitting the same notes you were hitting in your in your 30s. I mean... Are there? Were there? T- are you warming up every day? Are you? Are you doing any vocal lessons? Are you doing like dehumidifiers? I mean, are you? Are you? You know, are you doing anything like that? No, no. Uh, uh, although, uh, you know, you're being very kind to me, and I'm going to tell you, you know, if you go and you see a video of Magic Power from five years or ten years ago or whatever, and you go, oh, you're still hitting the high notes. Well, I go, okay. First of all. The videos where I didn't hit the notes, those aren't the ones we're going to put up on YouTube, you know, like the ones where I was flat as a pancake and having a tough night, you know, that's not the ones that are going to last and get a million hits, A. B, 
That magic power one, you're, I think you're probably referencing the one that I did at Daryl's place, and, you know, and, and the sound man there is unbelievably great. I wish I could remember his name, but uh, uh, so I could give him credit. But when you've got a really great mix live, it, it inspires you and it helps you to sing great. And that guy, I mean, come on, he'd been Daryl Hall's sound guy for decades. So he knows how to make a singer happy. And he made me happy that night, and I was able to bring it. Okay, next thing. That acoustic, there's, I'm playing in a duo with another guy. Our guitars are tuned down a half step. So I wasn't hitting the notes that I hit. I was hitting ones that were, you know, and I had already artfully rearranged some of the lines so that I'm not quite si singing the same lines that I sang on the record back in 1981. <laughs> Magic power, I'm going, yeah. What year was that? Like, I I'm not. And since then, it's gotten even worse. Like, you know, I've lost... Like, I used to be able to hit live, and I, I it's because of the way my, my throat is. I don't have, a, like, a, a complete falsetto. I have a kind of a half falsetto. It's half head, half chest. It's kind of... Because I have a nice, narrow set of vocal cords, I could hit really high notes, and I could sing high E's, high F sharps. So... The 14th fret on the first string of a guitar. I could hit that note night after night after night. Like, we did a thing once where we were opening for Journey. And I was backstage and Steve Perry came to me. And he said, are you hitting high D's and E's in that song? And I went, yeah. And he went, oh my God. Now, when Steve Perry is telling you, hey, man, you could sing high. That's... That's a tremendous compliment because Steve Perry, one of my favorite singers from that era, and he can't hit him anymore, and neither can I. It's like, I, you know, I've got nothing above an A anymore. So fifth fret, first string of the guitar. That's pretty much what I've got now, but not every night. So it's, <laughs> it, it, it's really not there. And the other thing is, and, I, you know, I, I tell you this so that, you know, for the benefit of all the people that are ever going to watch this, you, you want to artfully construct your set list so that you give yourself, first of all, anything that's going to be really high and really challenging, get yourself warmed up and then have it be early in the set when you're fresh. But after you've been up on stage for an hour and 15 minutes, yak, 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 and you've been singing, then don't have anything that's going to really, have it be that you're just going to have the gun throat crap at the end of the set where it won't really matter if you're a little out of tune but it's got high energy and it's going to work great. But also, if you've got challenges in terms of range, well, make the song before it be one where no challenges at all. It's easy. It's soft. It's quiet. It's down here. It's all uh, And make that so you get five minutes of it just resting so that you're gearing yourself up for when you're going to have to bring it later. You know, like... Um, these were things that I sort of understood naturally. So your question about warming up, I would, I, yes, I warm up. And the older I got, the more I had to warm up a little bit. But I never really want about, I kind of feel like it doesn't take me much to get my instruments ready to go. Uh, because I was always, like I did a lot of sports when I was a kid in high school. And I was a sprinter. I was not a long distance runner. Uh and yeah, I did a little bit of stretching, I did, but essentially it was like, bang, the gun goes off and I'm just using the adrenaline and for the next 10 seconds, you know, I'm going to be roaring down that straightaway. And that was the kind of guy I was. So musically, I sort of, I am kind of that same kind of a person. I, you know, the gun goes off and <laughs> I'm going to try and bring it, you know, and it's, it's part of the adrenaline of the moment. Uh, having said that, of course, I'm also not the kind of guy. Bruce Springsteen and what he does and with his instrument, and he does three hour shows. I go, not me. <laughs> like, I can't do that. Like, I could never do that. You know, once a set got past its 75 minute mark, I was going, it's time for Uncle Ricky to rest. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, uh, an encore at the 90 minute mark. Whoa, I would. Go back and I would be passing out in the dressing room, lying down and going, I'm done. Somebody break me some some tea. <laughs> so I am going to push back a little bit because I, I know you're trying to humble, be humble here, but 
it's not only just the range that you, you, I know, I know you've said you've lost a little bit of the range, but it's also the power you have in your voice, even at 70 years old. So, you know, even take Steve Perry, he did an album a couple years ago and, you know, obviously the songs were really good, but obviously he wasn't don't stop believing, right? You, on the other hand, like I said, that clip at the, um, song studio songwriting workshop you did, um, singing magic power, you dropped it from D to an A, um, the key, you still sing with such I don't want to say authenticity, but it's like the the conviction is still there in you. Is that something that's st- like is that in that kind of same world as like crafting the the set list to to work in your favor? Is that kind of in a similar thing, or is just that just something that just natural talent of being con- having that conviction when you sing? Uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, and, 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 well, uh, there's three things that I want to talk about. So first of all, I'm I w- I'm, I'm going to backtrack and I want to correct you. That clip that you that you saw, it wasn't from Song Studio. It was from something called ninety seven South ninety seven South Song Sessions, okay. and it was in Picton, Penticton. A guy named Robert Ott runs this thing every year, and he brings songwriters essentially to talk about songwriting. And it was a fantastic event, and it was really good. But I was kind of a keynote guy, and then he interview you, and then he, there's a guitar there, and every now and then it's like. Okay, yeah, pick up the guitar. But as you said, yeah, I magic power moved from the key of D down to the key of A. The key of A works for it because it gives open strings. It allows you to really kind of, in a way, there was some Pete Townsend in the way that I wrote that song originally. And now that I uh, moved it into a new key, I realized, wow, this thing, I can really dig into the guitar here and this really works. So I find that inspiring. It helps me as a singer if I'm finding a way into the song. And I think this is sort of answering your question in a backhanded way, but nevertheless. Um, when, any, when you're a singer and you're doing a song, you are uh, interpreting the song for an audience. And you are now sort of like an actor or an actress. You are trying to figure out what's my motivation here. How do I find my way emotionally to the heart of what's going on here? And so you need to be able to bring that and find that in the song every single time you bring it to to a performance in in a public situation. So that's why you rehearse. That's why you practice. That's why you arrange all of the things that you do in preparation for the moment where you go, all right, I'm getting to the chorus of this tune. I got to bring it. You know, I, I got to dig down deep and I got to bring it. And so now you sort of touched on this. There are these physical, mechanical things that happen, the engagement of your diaphragm in order to be able to be pushing that air out of your lungs. It was always easy for me. I was an athlete. I understood the whole thing about core. And now from your core, strength comes to do many things. You know, paddle a boat. You know, uh, be a baseball player that can climb the wall to make the catch. Like all of those things, core is incredibly important. So singing, you wouldn't think, oh, I, I should go to the gym. I should work out in order to be a better singer. But you should. <laughs> like, and not enough singers do it. You know, like it really is a thing about having your body be able to commit and I would be in classes sometimes with a singer, and they'd be singing, and I would say, stop, stop. You are supposed to be bringing this song from the balls of your feet to me. And you're not even, 80, 80% of you is not even engaged in this. Mm-hmm. And I need it right from your tree roots. you got to bring it. Like, come on, commit. And I think that's the big thing, is that people always have this, uh, it's almost like a shyness. Where they go, uh, I'm I'm too shy. I don't want to give myself up to the song. Mm-hmm. And you go, no, 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 that's you get the wrong idea here. You don't matter. Stop trying to protect your own fragile ego. Stop trying to protect your image of yourself. Just commit to the music and let them. It's why guitar players make all of those. You know the Joe Walsh faces when they're oh, yeah. when they're playing guitar. Yeah, yeah. It's like 
It's because you're in the music now. You're in the guitar now. You're not you. You're not worrying about what your face looks like. That's a stupid thing to worry about, you know? Just worry about whether or not you're squeezing the notes out of the strings. The same thing with your body. Like, when you sing, you got to find that thing inside you, and then you got to bring it out. Uh, so, I think I answered all of the, the, the three things that I thought of when you were asking the question. No, I love that. One of the best things I ever heard from a producer was uh, singing in the studio or singing in, in, in any situation is a form of acting and you need to play the character you are you are performing as. And if you don't, you're going you're gonna to miss the mark every time. Yeah, and the thing about that acting thing is, and ask any actor, you, you are not, you're not there. You, your job is to find who is this person that I'm doing? And you must be that person. You must be that character. And so, you know, in music, you must be that music. That's where you must be. You must be in that, that passage, that piece of music, that lyric, that melody. You know, that's where you have to be. And it's actually a pretty simple thing to say. It's, you know, it, it's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. You know, like... Yeah, to, and for that to become almost like second nature, you know, I spent a lifetime at it, and there were times where I was, you know, hey, I had a good day. There were times where I went, oh, just get, you know, somebody get me the hemlock, I'm ready to drink it. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, you, you, you know, you disappoint yourself because it's tough. But, you know, one of the things that I would always tell students is, you, you, this is what you want to be? You want to be an artist? Okay. Uh, 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 let's liken this to uh, sports. And the greatest hitter of all time in baseball was uh, the Georgia Peach Ty Cop. And he was a son of a bitch, but he batted .367, a lifetime batter, and was the greatest of all time. So he failed one of the six times out of ten. He failed. He was the greatest of all time, and he failed more than he succeeded. So... Hey, if you can bat 300, man, you get to be in the Hall of Fame. You know, probably you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. Because um, your average uh, major leaguer is hitting somewhere between 250 and 265, 270 maybe, and a good year, you know. Um, so that that's, failure is a way of life in the sport of baseball, you know. So um, in music, you kind of got to get used to that too, you know. You take your victories where you, when you can get them, and you're always focused on them and working towards them, but you must learn to be okay with failure. Then your song that you're trying to write didn't work out, that, yeah, your performance Wednesday in that bar was not very good, you know? Like, there's guys that I really admire, like Pat Metheny. He keeps a notebook, even now. He does a show. He sits down and he writes out, he listens to the whole show, and he makes notes. Like he, he, there's there's probably no greater guitar artist on the planet Earth than Pat Metheny. But that's how hard he still works. You know, that's that's what he still does because he realizes, and it's easier to fail than than it is to succeed. I cannot give myself a break here. I must maintain this work ethic, this discipline, because. You know, born to die, born to fail. Like that's part of the thing. You have to accept that and be be grateful for it. Happy. Rhinestone has a tier list of the most important things when it comes to making music that stands out, is original, and has a vibe. And so the tier list goes like this: it goes drums first, vocals, everything else. So. You know, you obviously, I've talked a lot about our drummer Erickson in the past, but I want to talk to you guys about vocals and why vocals are so important. Now, vocals are where personality and charisma and style and attitude and genre, all that kind of stuff comes into play when vocals are recorded. And so I want to give you guys kind of an example. It's like anytime you hear somebody like Kendrick Lamar or Taylor Swift or Billie Eilish or, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, or I'm trying to think of all these great vocalists that you guys know them, Freddie Mercury, John Lennon, anybody, anybody that's iconic to you, they have personality when they sing. 
and that comes through. You know it's them as soon as they start singing. Now, why is this? Now, it's, oh, it's just, they're such a great vocalist. It's, you know, because they have the range. No, a lot of times, you know what it is? It's just their personality comes through, and you can tell it's them. And in the world of the mundane, which is what we're living in, right? Like, there's so much mundane music out there. Personality is what sells music. It's not vocal talent. It's not range. It's the personality of the performance. So at Rhinestone, we coach for that. We coach for, let's get your personality shining through. Let's, let's put that personality in there so that you, are, you shine in a way that's different and that is representative of you and you stand out because you have something different about your music from your personality. And so this may seem like just nonsense, but I promise you it's not. If you go look at the list of songs we've done for full production for Rhinestone, there's a YouTube playlist on there on our, on our YouTube page kind of showing all the songs we've worked on what you'll see very quickly is that this vocalist their personality just comes through and I'm not trying to brag here but I'm really good at vocal production it's just one of those things that like I feel like it's kind of the X factor of why Rhinestone is as good as we are so what I want to tell you guys is normally vocal sessions for four hours is two hundred dollars right but I'm gonna cut you guys a deal today because I like you and I want you to have that personality come through if you send us the word vocals, V-O-C-A-L-S, make sure you get that S because I'm, I'm going to be watching, to rhinestonemusic at gmail.com, R-H-Y-N-E-S-T-O-N-E, music at gmail.com. Uh, I will give you $50 off your next vocal session with Rhinestone, and that will be it's $150 for four hours, which is a steal if you guys know some of the prices of vocal producers out there. And uh, you don't have to be, if you're in the Atlanta area, I'll come to you. If you are in outside of that, we have remote sessions that work really well. Um, it's not that much harder. It's a little bit of a setup, but I promise you it's well worth it to have someone there to coach you, to get the vocals on your side. Because also vocals can just be so intimidating, right? Like it's so personal and you become so self-critical in, in your own head. And when you're in your own head, you're not doing good vocals, yada, yada, yada. It's good to have someone there to help you nail those vocals. So. I want you guys to send the word vocals, V-O-C-A-L-S, to rhinestonemusic at gmail.com. And uh, I can't wait for y'all to get some great vocals. So hit me up. So we're going to take a little bit of a left turn here. Um, you we've, we've mentioned that you've done a bunch of teaching. And one of the things I was fascinated to learn was that you taught music business at Humber College in Toronto. What advice do you have for artists trying to make a career in music today? And has your advice changed since you quit teaching? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and part of it is uh, the reason I quit was because I, I really honestly, truly felt like I was not qualified to teach about it anymore because the music business had changed so much from the music business that I knew and the music business where I could get up on my hind legs and bark like, like a dog and go, okay, Everybody pay attention to this lecture that I'm about to give you because, you know, I know because I've been there. And then I realized, well, I haven't been there anymore. <laughs> like, what it is now is not what uh, where I was at, you know. So, uh, yes, that absolutely may be. And in my memoir, I think uh, I, when I wrote about the music business, there's a little chapter in there about it. And. You know, I, there's a, a famous quote from Hunter S. Thompson, which is sort of like, uh, the music business is a plastic shallow trench where thieves and pimps go to die, you know, I, I, and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and there's also a, a negative side. <laughs> that was his quote, right? So, um, and, and I used to, in my mid-business class, I used to tell students, you know, there's a real truth in this. That what he's saying is, it, it, this is a tough business and it's and it's a, it's a horrible one, uh, but you, you've got to sort of gratefully accept that, and and kind of go yeah yeah sure, but you know uh, I'm indomitable. I, th th this isn't going to stop me. You know I I can I'm going to make this happen and I'm not going to give up. And, and so so there needs to be that kind of persistence uh, to your ambition, uh, but. Uh, uh, there's a, there was a, a famous quote, wasn't it? It was Steve Swallow, musician, who said, if you want to be in the music business, don't, because it's horrible. But if you have to be in the music business, 
then go ahead and do it because it's the greatest life that you could possibly imagine. And I think that is part of it, that if you uh, are, uh, if it's an advocation, if you hear the call, then it's like the priesthood. Say, you got to go do it. Like, uh, there's no point in fighting that. You, you know, and your uh, uh, ambition and your motivation will will get you to your inspirations, and it'll it'll work out. You know, um, but if you're, you doubt wins over your, uh, you know, your ability to formulate a plan. <laughs> you're you're kind of doomed from the outset. You know. Um, and it, you know the difference between then and now is, I would probably be harsher than I was. I probably I I kind of loved the idea of trying to help students, every student, and make it be a level playing field. And and uh, and then I was starting to become frustrated with the fact that I would see people and they weren't giving me the effort that I thought was required or the focus that I thought was required or they didn't seem to be, uh, they seemed to feel like the world was, th there was a, a sense of entitlement to what was happening in terms of the student cohort. And I was going, you don't get it. Like, you know, uh, and then I was going, well, maybe I don't get it, uh, you know. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but the, the world has changed in so many other ways. Uh, feminism and, and uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and, and, you know, all of these kinds of things where here I was, a privileged old white guy, mm -hmm. and I went, yeah, I should get out of the way. You know, like I really should get out of the way so that younger people, uh, people of color, oh, oh, you know, uh, people who are, uh, with different chromosomes than me. Like, I, I need to make it so that uh, I'm not uh, a problem to the way that the world is hoping to evolve. So uh, part of that solution was then get your fat white ass out of the way. <laughs> it's not that fat, really, but, you know, it's old. Get your old white ass out. <laughs> I like it. So, uh, Rick, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, is another 15 okay, or do you need to get hard stop? Uh, no, I, I, I get, you know, I, if I had to push the other one back a little, I'll push the other one back. I think my next one is at two, so okay, you, you're all right. You want another 10 or 15, I'll give it to you. Awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So, we're just going to have one more question. I'm going to ask you an audience question and then a, rap, a, a series of quick rapid-fire questions, and we'll wrap up. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I'll, I'll make my answer shorter too. That's what, whatever you want to do, man. It's all you. All right. Okay. So many people consider Triumph's performance at 1983's Us Festival to be one of the pinnacles of 80s hard rock live performances. Between Triumph starting in 1977 and the US or Us Festival performance, what were some of the key breakthroughs you and Triumph had as live performers? Yeah, we started in 75 and... Um, the record deals kind of started Canada 76, America 77. So, okay. uh, and all of those things become like critical kinds of, uh, you know, I don't, watershed moments. You know, you sign a record deal for the, you know, out of Canada for the United States and you go, oh, you know, this is, this is big, you know, but you know, th there's things that happen in a, in a career where I know, I'll give you an example. Triumph would, uh, we got our own tractor trailer truck and we had our own, uh, sound and lights and so when we were going to america we didn't do it the conventional way of going out and be an opening act on somebody else's tours we we told rca records you, you got to give us tour support we're going to go play uh, you know cleveland and we want to play the small theater we're going to do a cheap ticket with the radio station but we want a headline and they went headline you've never even played the city before we go i know but we'll pay for the house and and the promoter will pay us uh, sound and lights money on the show and we'll actually still get a you know hundred dollar paycheck each uh pay our roadies pay for our gas we're gonna make money at this as long as we get your tour support so right from the get-go so that kind of thinking was the kind of thinking that was prevalent in triumph 
more from my partners than me. They had a lot more understanding of that kind of stuff to make that happen. Uh, but I was along for the ride and going, yeah, yeah, great, you know, you know. So, so those kinds of things are happening all the way along the line. We're talking our way into headlining. In 1978, Triumph closed the Canada Jam Outdoor Festival in, in Mossport, uh, Ontario, Canada, which was kind of like Woodstock in a way. It was one of the promoters was the guy from Woodstock, Lynch Stogel. And Mike Levine talked him into the idea of, well, no, Triumph, you know, we're big news here. And he's going, I never heard of it. He's going, well, you know, we really, we got a lot of effects. We're going to need to close the show. He goes, you want to close the show? Fine. You know. So, of course, we do that. And then there's guys in Canada going, Triumph is closing the show? They're, they're like, you know, there's got the the Commodores and the Village People in Kansas. And there's all of these big name bands on that show. How does Triumph get to close that show? That doesn't make any sense. But it was like, we're moving up. We're moving up. These things are happening, you know. Um, yeah, so that, that, that kind of process of declaration above the pack that was a kind of a a, a a thing that worked so you mentioned us festival 83 you know certainly when um earlier than that when land on the line from just a game started to cross over uh well it was it was big on aor fm radio uh hold on got play on am radio from that album that those were big that was the third album that was 1979 but then 81 Allied Forces album, Magic Power, Fight the Good Fight. Uh, like in California, at the radio stations out there, they played songs out there like it was Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Ordinary Man got played like it was Stairway to Heaven. So uh, there were places in the United States we'd go and Ordinary Man wasn't getting played anywhere, you know. But so no airplay. So there's no point in playing that. We'd go to California and they'd go, why didn't you play Ordinary Man in your show? That's one of your best songs. And you go, it is? <laughs> like, you know, like, I didn't know that. So radio airplay becomes a huge thing that's part of the game. Um, and that led to the US Festival in 83. Um, and then, you know, I would say another big moment after that was we left RCA. We went to MCA. MCA put out Thunder 7. We toured on that. That was maybe one of the biggest tours in the history of the band. We had... Pepsi as a tour sponsor in Canada. We had uh, Budweiser as a tour sponsor in the States. So we had our own private jet. You know, it's like it was that was pretty pretty big stuff. You know, we we had concert videos on on MTV. Yeah, that that, that was pretty big. That's awesome. I love I that. Us Festival performance is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. It's just start to finish. You guys are lights out. It's it's great. I, it, it really it really inspires me as a musician. Okay, Thanks. I I admit I had a good day that day. You like, did, man. You know, Oof. Yeah, I, I had a pretty good day. And the thing was, we played the night before in Florida, like well, sort of the afternoon. But we were on a ZZ Top outdoor stadium show. We went to the airport. We flew. We had a nap. We got up. We climbed in the helicopter. We flew over to the site. I was just going, "Hey, Rick, relax. Be calm." You know, hydrate, get ready for this. Because and the other thing was, Banner, we only had to play like about a, a, a I think it was like a, a sixty with a with an encore or like a it was yeah. like a seventy minute show. So we didn't have to do the full kind of ninety and it was in the daylight outside and it was kinda of like, Yeah, all we gotta do is just be a band and rock. So let's just do that, you know. So that was kinda of, it was fun. It yes, it was a big event in our life, yes. I don't know how you hit those notes and lay it on the line on a cross country flight, like in a nap. Like what? I just like that's so crazy to me because you hit some insane notes and lay it on the line on that performance. I mean, especially when you you guys do in the studio version of the stacked harmonies, but when you hit that high note, it's just like Jesus Christ, why even bother? Like <laughs> just let you do it. <laughs> yeah, that that's an F. That and that's in you see it in the standard key. That would be like thirteenth fret. Yeah, of the first string of of, of an electric guitar, uh, but but I could do those night after night after night. That was no, that was not a problem just because of the way my pipes were. Yeah. Look, one of my favorite singers was Ian Gillen of Deep Purple, mm -hmm. and I I used to do in a bar band before I joined Triumph. We used to do um, Child in Time at the at the end of the night of the, the it was a song that went like 
tonk, 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 and it had these melodies. But when it would get going, he would be doing this. So an A, G, E. So an octave above what I was, no, I even know. more, an octave and a half probably from what I was just singing. But and he would have to do that, and I would go, well, if Ian Gillen can hit A's, by God, I can hit F's, you know. Now, he was doing it with a kind of a falsetto scream, what the metal guys do. Yeah. You know, it's not really the voice that I had, but... Hey, I saw a clip the other day of John Anderson of Yes, he was one of my favorite singers. Mm -hmm. And he could still bring it, like, you yeah. know, and he's got to be in his... He's got to be hitting 80 soon, you know? Yeah, he's so got a... He's got a he's got a project with his two kids where they do yes songs and it's it's yeah. really good very well done. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, it, I think it's just a genetic gift. You know, that's part of it. And if you don't have the genetic gift, you should harm yourself trying to make your throat do something that it can't. You know, just know what it is that you you can do, and you know, make that be your voice. It's like there was a time when uh, radio in the states. You know, they were playing high singers like me. But then they started getting into the thing of Seattle and the grunge goes, Are all the guys that sang like this and the voices? You know, sounded like they were from Creed or they were from Soundgarden or, you know. And now it was, you know, low baritone kind of dudes. Mm -hmm. And, and Eddie Van Ayer, you know, uh, like, <laughs> that was the thing. And so I think people have just got to figure out what their thing is and don't harm yourself, you know. I think I found the sound for your next album, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> you, okay, questions. Come on, give me these. Let's do these rapid. Short blasters, right? Let's do it. All right, rapid fire. Here we go. What is the last album that blew your mind? Uh, ooh, um, Hashira by Joni Mitchell, which it's really old, but I hadn't listened to it in like forever. And because of a project that I'm considering do, that I'm doing, I, I revisited that. And yeah, so Hishira. Okay. All right. I'm getting rid of my phone. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Who I, is I it? put it on silent, but it rang anyways. I don't know. It, it Maybe happens. I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know how to turn it off. Okay, go. Who is an artist that deserves more attention? Uh, oh, um... Uh, Pat Metheny is one of my favorites, and I love him. And uh, but he, I mean, he's kind of internationally renowned, so that's maybe unfair. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a young person that needs a a plug. You know, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, Julian Lodge is a beautiful jazz guitarist. You know, um, uh, so I wish him every success. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody really young that I think is really cool. Um, man, let's move on. I've okay. already named some. That's good. If you lost all of your gear in a tragic house fire and had to start over with only $1,000, what would you get? Uh, I would get myself probably some kind of a, uh, um, a budget. 335 guitar or a or a half decent telecaster and i would get myself uh some kind of about a 500 hundred dollar amp and then i would start going out and doing um jobbing gigs with that equipment so that i could earn more money so that i could go and start buying more stuff i dig it i respect it who is a songwriter you look up to um John Mayer. Okay. Uh, uh, wow. I mean, you know, who, who, who's in the Hall of Fame for me? Now, you know, I don't know. Bob Dylan, Paul McCartney, uh, you know, uh, Hank Williams. Who did I teach units about, you know, when I was in, you know, in college? Everybody from John Dowland of the 16th, 1600s to, you know, uh, uh, Johnny Mercer. Um, there's a guy that people don't know too much about, uh, Bob Crew. He wrote all the hits for the Four Seasons, but you know how uh, 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 Lady Marmalade became a, a hit when 
you know, uh, all the girls sang it. It was in Rue Moulin Rouge. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yes, Bob, yeah, yeah, Bob, yeah, yeah. Bob Crew wrote that tune. Oh. Like, the guy, no, I, the guy knew how to write pop tunes, you know. Yeah. Because uh, he'd written them in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and then the new century, he's still having hits. And you go, okay, he must have done something right. <laughs> I like that. I'll have to check in, check out more of his stuff. What do people get wrong about being a musician? Uh, they think it's about them. Wow, that's a great answer. I love that. All right, and then final question. What is a failure that has shaped who you are now as a musician? Uh, well, the one of the earliest ones was uh, as a football player uh, in high school. Uh, who was kind of a big man on campus because of my you know, physical abilities, with my, mostly my speed. Some guy ran into me sideways in a night game and tore my ACL. And that was kind of the end of my uh, ambitions as a jock. And I took all of that and they went, right, going to go get myself a budget Telecaster and a little amp and I'm going to become a side man in a, in a jobbing band and I'm going to start becoming i'm gonna take my energies and i'm gonna put them towards music well, that's awesome well thank you so much rick for coming on the rhinestone podcast i had such a wonderful time with you you developed so much great information that i think our audience is really going to enjoy so everybody if you can go check out rick emmett's new memoir lay it on the line a backstage pass to rockstar adventure conflict and triumph which comes out today the day we are recording this october 10th 2023 it is a fantastic cerebral look at one of rock and roll's i think greatest minds which is you rick and uh it was absolutely a pleasure man thank you so much for showing up on the podcast Bader, thank you and may i compliment you on having the hair of a viking <laughs> hey thank, had to bring it out for you man thank you so much it looks good it looks fantastic thank you so much i work hard on it <laughs> <laughs> all right Hey everybody, that was our show. I want to thank Rick Emmett and his team for coming on the podcast. It was such an amazing time to talk to a rock legend, get his words of wisdom on so many different things, on how he plays the game. Um, I really loved learning about kind of how he handles his vocal health and how he thinks about music. And it's just, it's great. It's awesome to see. Rick is just a one of a kind talent. And I'm so happy that he was able to come on the podcast and chill and hang out with us. Um, I also want to thank Batty Music Madness for having uh, Target Rockstar as the intro and outro music. I want to thank uh, Marco Restrepo and myself, I'm on this song, uh, for putting California Cool in ad number one. And for ad number two, we have uh, our Christmas single by Zach Stitch, who's a uh, songwriter here in West Georgia. And uh, this is called Mrs. Claus. It's fantastic. We're starting to hop into country music now, which is just making me so excited. Because um, country music, they like money, man. They like, they like throwing that money around. So... Uh, and then, uh, uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah. I want to thank our editor, Irvin. Irvin has just been killing it on these edits for the podcast. He's been really bringing it together. So you guys can shout out Irvin in the comments. Um, he is, he's just the man. He's so good. Uh, Irvin is just taking this podcast to a new level and has just taken so much of weight off my shoulders. And Irvin's just such a great piece of, um, of the rhinestone team. So, and then last but not least, if you want to find me or talk to me, my name is Banner Driscoll, B-A-N-N-E-R-D-R-I-S-K-E-L-L. -L. Um, I'm most active on the Instagram and TikTok pages for Rhinestone. You can also find me on my own personal page, which is Banner Driscoll Media. So B-A-N-N-E-R-D-R-I-S-K-E-L-L-M-E-D-I-A. Um, wherever you do social media, Banner Driscoll Media, you can find me there. You can message me there. Um, and uh, until next time, y'all, until next time, shine like the star you are.